Choose Empire and get free or low-cost benefits for the whole family. Pay little to nothing from baby's first checkup to filling your prescriptions all the way to yearly dental exams. Trust Empire Health Plans for your family. Click or tap the banner to learn more. To learn more about applying for health insurance, including Medicaid, Child Health Plus, Essential Plan, and Qualified Health Plans through New York State of Health, the official health plan marketplace, visit www.nystateofhealth.ny.gov or call 1-855-355-5777. Welcome to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, episode number 23. Don't settle. Steve Jobs. This is the Film Entrepreneur Podcast, where we teach you the top strategies, tactics, and growth hacks that every indie filmmaker needs to know to make money with their films. We are the podcast that puts the business back into show business. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Film Entrepreneur Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur Method will set you up for success. If you want to pre-order the book, just head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. It will be available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook on December 2nd. Now, before we get started, I wanted to let you guys know that it is Black Friday week at Indie Film Hustle, and specifically Black Friday week at IndieFilmHustle.tv. I have done a complete rebranding and update on Indie Film Hustle TV. I've added dozens of new courses, workshops, seminars, and interviews, as well as a couple of docs and movies to the platform. And only this week, you get a 20% discount on the yearly subscription to Indie Film Hustle TV. It's normally $99.95, but this week only, it will be $79.99. You just have to use the coupon code Black Friday 2019. That's Black Friday 2019, and you get access to all the hundreds. I think we're getting close to thousands of hours of content, and we're really going to be focusing the whole platform on education, on building the greatest online hub for film education that has ever been created, and not just your normal here's a lens, here's a camera kind of education. We'll have that stuff. But real world, raw truth style education that you've come to expect from me and Indie Film Hustle. We're going to be adding, we added a ton of stuff for screenwriters and for filmmakers and for film entrepreneurs. And there's going to be a lot of new content that I'll be working on in the new year. That's going to be exclusively on Indie Film Hustle TV. So just go to IFHTV or IndieFilmHustle.tv and sign up and use the coupon code Black Friday 2019. The sale ends at midnight on Cyber Monday, December 2nd. Now guys, today on the show, I'm going to talk about why your movie is not worth what it used to be. Now the film industry is going through a major shift. And this shift is as big as when we went from black and white films to color, or when we added sound to the movies and became talkies. It is a monumental shift in the way the industry is run, and independent filmmakers need to understand what's going on and how they can position themselves and their films in this new reality that is the film industry. Now, the business is changing from a product-based business, which is DVDs and Blu-rays, to a service 
based business, which is streaming services. And by doing this, there has been a massive devaluation of intellectual property and the value of movies and video content in general. Now, Spotify in the music side of the business and other music streaming services have devalued music down to basically nothing, to making it almost worthless. What used to cost you as the consumer $17.99 for one album to get one or two hits and a bunch of songs you didn't even want now costs fractions of a penny. Now on the Spotify streaming service, specifically to Spotify, an artist needs around 337,000 plays to earn $1,472 a month, the monthly minimum wage. Though I don't know how many people can actually live on $1,400 a month in today's world here in the U.S. at least, but that is the minimum to make a living with your art on a platform like Spotify, on that one revenue stream. Now let's jump over to the video side of things. On Amazon Prime, and I know a lot of people you know, because of Distriber and what happened with the whole film aggregator thing, I'm like, I'm just going to upload my movie to Amazon Prime myself, Amazon Prime Video Direct, and put it up on Prime and get my rentals and TVOD and all that kind of stuff. Well, if you put it up on Prime, I just want you to understand what you're going to get paid. You get paid six cents per hour viewed. Not per minute, per hour viewed. Now, I know it doesn't sound a lot, but believe it or not, people are making money with that revenue stream. It, You know, it it can do very well for you, but the key is to diversify those revenue streams as much as humanly possible. But before, Amazon used to pay 15 cents per hour viewed, which still sounds ridiculous, right? Because in the olden days, it would cost you $3.99 to rent a movie or $10 to $15 to buy a DVD or $25 to buy a Blu-ray. And that was when the money was flowing in the business, and that's why... My last episode where I was talking about the death of traditional film distribution, that's when everybody was just making all sorts of crazy money. And they, you really didn't even have to make good movies. You could just slap it out into the DVD market and you'd be able to make money. But those days are gone. Now, the streaming, the, the streaming platforms are paying you less and less for your films. And that's just the truth. Now, you could diversify those revenue streams by splitting it out to many different platforms like Tubi, like Pluto, like Amazon Prime, and then maybe going onto some transactional video on demand, though I wouldn't recommend that uh, unless you have an audience. But you could start spreading it out to multiple different platforms, and hopefully you can get a little bit here, a little bit there, so on and so forth. Now, of course, I've talked to you about in, in nauseam in regards to the film entrepreneur method where you can generate multiple revenue streams that are not dependent on the exploitation of the movie. But that's another conversation. We're just talking about where we are right now and what your movie is worth in the marketplace. Because these streaming platforms are paying you less and less, the chances of you being able to recoup a higher budget is becoming harder and harder. You know, one thing I did notice at AFM when I was talking to filmmakers is that the mentality was still very 90s and 2000s. The budgets were still going up and they were dealing with business models that don't exist anymore. This business model of streaming platforms paying so little for your work is unsustainable. It's not sustainable. You know, to create a song, generally speaking, is a lot less expensive than creating a movie. Creating an album is a lot less expensive than creating a movie for an independent producer or independent artist. And yet, we're getting paid just slightly a bit more than what an artist would get paid on these streaming platforms. And because the streaming platforms have a direct connection to the customer, there's very little that we can do about it. Now, I will give you some tips on what we can do about it at the end of the episode, but I want to explain to you how companies like Disney, Amazon, and Apple have a business model that will not only ensure their survival in the new film economy, but they will flourish. And the reason why these specific companies I just threw out will completely dominate moving forward over all the other studios is because their main businesses are not making movies. 
And I include Disney in that, by the way. They use media as, as a marketing vehicle to sell other products and services. So I did a little research and I went into the corporate filings of Disney and I wanted to see where they're really making their money and how much money they're actually making and because they're a publicly held company, all that information is available to anybody with an internet connection. So as Disney's revenue breaks down like this, guys. 44% of the money they make is from media networks, licensing deals from ESPN, Disney Channel, FX Networks, etc., to cable and streaming platforms. Then 17% is from studio entertainment. That's the actual exploitation of the product of the movie itself, meaning sales or revenue generated from viewing or getting access to their studio entertainment. And then 11% is consumer goods and interactive entertainment. Now, that 28% of parks and and resorts, a lot of consumer goods are sold at those parks and are part of those revenue streams. So together, between media networks, parks and resorts, and consumer goods, they all dwarf the movie-making side of the business. We're talking about 17% of all the business that Disney, the Walt Disney Company does, is actual studio entertainment. Where they're geniuses, if they've built an infrastructure and a system and a network to exploit the brands and IPs that they have personally and have acquired over the course of the last 20 years. That's why when they bought Marvel for four and a half million, best deal they ever got. When they bought Star Wars for about the same, best deal they ever got. When they bought Pixar for like 7.6 or something billion, great, great purchase. And now they just bought Fox. Fox. So all of that content gets thrown in. I did the numbers, and do you know how much Disney generates a day? Just so you understand, I want you to understand these numbers so you understand where the world is and where it's going. Disney generates $36 million $220,000 a day. And this year, they're estimated to break almost $70 billion in gross revenue. And I promise you, that is not from the box office. And it's not from DVDs or Blu-rays. And now Disney is one of the first big studios to come out with its own major streaming platform of any magnitude. Seriously. Disney Plus is a huge sign of where the film industry is going. At its launch, it had 10 million subscribers. It took HBO uh, Now or Plus or whatever it was uh, to get to, I think, 5 million. It took them three years. And they have a fraction of the amount of content. The direct-to-consumer model, which is where these studios and companies are going to, is going to kill and is killing the middleman, that includes DVD manufacturers and retailers, includes cable networks and channels, which are being, the cord is being cut left and right, satellite as well. That also includes movie theater chains. Right now, it's on the, it's on the table at, in Washington that they're going to throw out this old law that states that movie studios cannot run their own private theater chains. To, to only show their movies. I said it was an antitrust thing back in the day. But now that we have direct, you know, direct access and, and direct to the consumer models like Disney Plus or Netflix or any of these other kind of you know, distribution outlets, it's almost like a, I, I, I already thought it was done. I thought, that, I thought that law was thrown out years ago, but apparently it hasn't. So what do you think that's going to do to movie theaters if, they, if the studios have their way? And specifically, when I talk about studios, there's a handful. There's the six big studios, but there's only maybe three that have any chance of surviving the next five or ten years. If not, they're going to just get eaten up by one of the other big ones. People who have IPs, people who have franchises, or are able to create franchises and then able within their system to exploit and create multiple revenue streams from those IPs. Now, Amazon Studios is a very interesting model 
Because if you've noticed, the movies and the movies that they're purchasing and the series they're creating are very different than what, let's say, Disney is doing. If you've noticed that they've been buying sh- movies like The Big Sick, their new movie, The Aeronauts, uh, as well, is very kind of different things that a studio wouldn't normally do. Shows like Transparent, which are very niche and very specific. They have someone like Ted Hope working for them in the back office at Amazon Studios because he is a champion of independent film from the olden days of the 80s and 90s. He was there championing true independent filmmaking. So they brought him in because they wanted to create films and series that were aimed at a specific niche, art house kind of people. That's why they were buying a lot of Sundance films early on. That's why they were that's why they've opened up their platforms to us, the independents. Why? Because that kind of material, that kind of content attracts a certain kind of customer. Because Amazon Studios is not in the business of making money with their movies. It is a marketing machine for you to buy a Prime account and to buy products from Amazon. Amazon makes 67% of its revenue from selling goods and services through Amazon. And then they make about maybe like 3% from Amazon Studios. But do you see that their business model, how robust it is? They're using video content, they're using series and movies to sell product. They're reversing the film entrepreneur method in many ways. And I have a chapter about that in my book about how to reverse the film entrepreneur method. But that's what they're doing. That business model is sound. They're diversified to the hilt. I want you to see what the new world is doing with movies, with series, with content. It is no longer about selling the content itself. Can you make money selling it? Of course. You can license it. You can sell it in TVOD if you have the audience. You can, you can do uh, SVOD and AVOD. There's still ways of making it, making money with it. But the amount of money you can make has dropped. It has dropped dramatically. So this new world of the Disneys, the Amazons, the Apple of the world, which is using content as a marketing, just a marketing powerhouse to sell other things. Apple is using Apple TV to sell more physical Apple TVs. They're using Apple TV Plus to sell those little Apple TV boxes. And they're also using it to sell iPhones and uh, um, the iWatches and computers and iPads and all the other eyes, things, and all the other Apple products they have because you're going to want to consume those con- that content that they're creating on their products. It is a marketing play, guys. That is where this whole world of media is going. Authors are doing it as well. They are. Authors are doing it in the book industry. Musicians are doing it in the music industry. And now it's our turn to start doing it in the film industry. The old way of doing things is dying. And entire sub-industries are trying to hold on for dear life to the status quo. Movie theaters are struggling. I don't care what anyone says, but you could just look at the numbers Revenue is down and it's going down more and more. They're trying to keep it alive as much as they can, but I don't think movie theaters will go away completely, but they will not be what they are today. That I can promise you. At AFM, I heard from many distributors telling me that theatrical was not a growth segment of the industry anymore. By the way, theaters do have a great potential for indie movies and niche movies going theatrical because all those theaters, there's there's thousands and thousands of screens in the United States and they will want to fill them up. And there's only so many movies that the studios are making. Disney made 17 movies last year and that number is going to start drizzling down a little bit more because they're going to be focusing more and more on their new Disney Plus initiative where they're going to start seeing more and more revenues. It's going to get to a point where the studios will go directly to the, to the customer and cut out everybody because it's more money in their pockets. So that model is going to happen one day. In our lifetime, I believe it will. But the devaluation of movies and series began with YouTube. 
the free version of Spotify for videos, essentially. There's been a generation raised on getting video content for free whenever they want. Movies and series, of course, fell into that well. So just, just because you watch cat videos, you would then assume that you should get movies and series for free as well. Then Netflix came along and gave us the ability to watch films and series as part of a small monthly fee. And we no longer had to wait for weeks to watch full seasons of our favorite shows or suffer through commercials. We could now binge entire shows in a few days commercial free. Now with many streaming series available, why would you buy or rent a film if it's going to be available on the streaming service in a few weeks? See, independent filmmakers need to understand this. They think that because they're going to put it up on TV like iTunes or, or, or Amazon or Google Play that you're going to make mad money in rentals and sales. If you can drive traffic to it and you've got an audience that's niche enough and an audience that's passionate enough to pay you for your video content, all more power to you. Can it be done? Absolutely it can be done. But it's becoming rarer and rarer to have that happen. Our habits are going more towards streaming getting our content from either AVOD or SVOD, period. The value of your independent film is just dwindling by the second. And I'm not trying to say this to depress you. I want you to understand the realities of the marketplace. And most filmmakers don't understand that. Most independent film producers don't understand that. So you have to really get to know the marketplace. You've got to start thinking like businesses. Okay, look at the big studios. Everyone's catching up to Disney. Everyone. There's not one studio out there right now that doesn't wish they were Disney, that they owned all those IPs, that have that, not only owned those IPs, but had the infrastructure to be able to exploit every single way to squeeze as much juice out of those movies as humanly possible by creating thousands of ancillary revenue streams that go on for years and years and years through their consumer product lines, through their networks, through their parks and resorts. It really is remarkable. So don't feel that you're like, oh, I I didn't know. The studios didn't know either. I'm I'm being honest with you. A lot of those studios are still working in the model of, I'm going to make a product, I'm going to exploit that product and generate revenue from it. But the bottom line is that that model is getting harder and harder to make work. Can it be done? Of course it can be done. The right project, the right marketing, the right everything, sure. But it's getting harder and harder, and you can just see it. Why is everybody going more towards television? Because that's where all the money is being made. It's easier, it's less money up front, And you could generate much more money with it. Like I said on my last show, Breaking Bad generated $410 million and then some. South Park was just licensed by Viacom for half a billion dollars to HBO Max for their new streaming service. Half a billion for all of that content. Do do you see what I'm saying? Not to mention the billions of dollars that they've made with that content over the years. This is just a streaming license. They still do their own business off of South Park. I want you, I'm I'm telling you all these stories and I'm telling you all this information so you really get a grasp of what the marketplace is and where we as independent filmmakers fit into that ecosystem. Now, the other big problem that we face as independent creators is that the volume of content that's being dumped into the marketplace It's like a massive ocean. Every day, there's hundreds, if not thousands of hours being thrown into a a content ocean. And I'm not talking even about YouTube. I'm not even talking about video games. I'm not talking about all the other things that compete for our attention. I'm just talking about straight movies and series. There's hundreds, if not thousands of hours being dumped into that ocean every single day. And now, along with the studios, independent films have to fight for attention. Period. It's basic economics, guys. The more quantity of a product you have on the shelf, the cheaper it is. It's supply and demand. There's, way t- there's a lot of demand, but there's more supply than we, than we can ever consume. 
So how can an independent filmmaker survive in this new film economy? You have to niche down. You have to focus your work on a specific audience that you can reach or cultivate. May I say you have to become a film entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial filmmaker. Musicians had to deal with this as well as authors. You see, you have to understand there's two other industries that this happened to before. It was a publishing world. It happened first in the publishing world with ebooks. It changed the game where before you could only buy your, your book for $24.95 in hardcover first, then they held it for months before then they would they get sucked all the money they could out of that book. Then they would release it on paperback six, nine months later. Now you could get an ebook for under 10 bucks. And Amazon controlled that pricing because Amazon was the big player in town. Then came the music industry where they had to fight technology. They tried to hold on to the way they were doing business because they were making gangbuster money. I'm they were going crazy. Talking about $17.99, $15.99 for CDs. Do you know what it cost them? It cost them a dollar. A dollar to produce a CD. And they were selling it for $17.99 retail. They were trying to hold on to that money as long as they could. Then this MP3 thing showed up. Then piracy showed up. And all the, th- the whole world came crashing down. But they also fought to hold on to the status quo when they should have been focusing on the new technology and control it and dictate it. But instead, they had someone like Steve Jobs come in and basically write the rules because he had all the, he had all the answers. And he created iTunes and changed the, changed the way the game was played. But understand, musicians have begun to focus on building themselves as brands and using their music as advertising to sell ancillary products, to get sponsorships, and to do touring. Because you can't bootleg a t-shirt, a hat, an autograph signing, a picture, a photo op, or a, a live experience. You can't bootleg that. So that's where they're making their money. You can't bootleg a sponsorship. Because they're building and cultivating audiences. So that's why a lot of fans are giving their music away to build their brand. They understand that it's a loss leader. Now, independent filmmakers can do this as well. I'm not saying you have to give your movie away, though there is there's still there are still ways to generate revenue from your from your art, but it's not you're not gonna make the same amount of money that you used to. It's gonna be more and more difficult to do so. But you can do this as well when you focus on a niche audience. As I've said a thousand times, the riches are in the niches. Now, piracy is a huge problem for all the media industries, books, music, and movies. But Steve Jobs said it best. You can't stop piracy. You can't fight piracy. You can only compete with it. And that's when you think outside the box. That's when it becomes so impossible to pirate a t-shirt, a course, a niche service, a sponsorship. You just need to think outside the box, guys. The business is changing whether you like it or not. And if you don't change the way you think about making films, I hate to tell you, you will not survive. You might be able to make one movie here or there, and you might become a hobbyist. And that's fine. If you don't want to make a living doing your, your art, you don't have to. This podcast, as well as Film Entrepreneur, as well as all the companies that I've put together, are to help you build a business, to help you make a living doing what you love to do. That's why I'm here. Now, there's nothing wrong with being a hobbyist. It would be the equivalent of me buying a guitar and playing uh, a gig here and there. Maybe if I'm lucky, go to a coffee shop and play for tips or something on the street. That's a hobby. Because I can't live off of my art. The same thing goes for filmmakers. You've got to think about the business, guys. You have to think about it. If you don't, you're not going to make it. And unlike that guitar, and unlike musicians, it's much more expensive to create our art. It's probably one of the most expensive art forms on the planet. And you've got to deal with a lot of people, most of the time, to create the art. It's a collaborative art as well. So you can't just sit there and write a book. You can't just sit there and play the guitar and write a song. It's a very expensive art form, and you need to understand the business if you want to try to make a go of this. 
Now, you can sit there and complain. You can sit there and hold on to the good old days of the way it used to be when you used to make a lot more money, like the music industry did for a long time and the publishing business did for a long time. You can sit there and talk about how things should be or you can adjust and pivot your approach to making and selling your films or you're going to end up like Blockbuster Video, Toys R Us, Circuit City, Virgin Records, and the many other corpses of companies who didn't change with the times. I hope you really understand wholeheartedly what I'm trying to do here. I'm not doing this to scare you. I'm not doing this to depress you. I'm telling you the reality. I'm telling you the raw truth of what this business is today. And I promise you, in six months, in a year, after all these other platforms show up, when Peacock shows up, which is the NBC Universal one, when HBO Max gets released, when all these other smaller AVOD ones, AVOD uh, platforms are going to start popping up, who knows how this business is going to change again? It's an ever-changing business. You need to stay on top of what's selling because I, it takes so long to make a movie that when you started – you might think, well, AVOD must be the way to go. So we're going to focus our whole business plan around AVOD and this or that to try to make as much gener- make, generate as much revenue as we can. But by the time the movie is done, which could be a year from now, AVOD might be dead. And the new thing that just came up, who knows what it is? The business is just changing. It's just changing. But the things that you can do to protect yourself from these changes is the following. Niche down to an audience that you can cultivate or that you can target. Better to cultivate than target, in my opinion, but you can do either either or. It's much easier once you've cultivated the audience, which also takes time. You keep your budgets as low as humanly possible. I said this in past episodes. Keep that overhead low. The lower, the better. Someone gives you $100,000 to make a movie, make two movies if you can Make three with that same hundred grand. Diversify your risk. That's you have to think about it like a portfolio. You got to think about it like a business. And I know a lot of you are like I'm, oh, I'm an artist. I'm an artist. That's great. I'm an artist too. But you can't. You can be an artist and a business person at the same time. Do you think that all of these big directors that you look up to that they're not businessmen and women? Seriously. You think that Guillermo del Toro, Chris Nolan, David Fincher, Steven Spielberg, Francis Ford Coppola, any of these guys, Martin Scorsese, you don't think these guys are businessmen and women? They have to be. They have to understand the business. If not, they won't make it. And it's funny that Francis Ford Coppola, who's arguably one of the greatest directors of all time and directed some of the greatest films of all time, and said the only time he ever made real money is when he started selling wine. Because <laughs> that's a real business, he said. It's sad, but it's true. It's insane. But he was able to create an ancillary product line from his brand, Coppola Wines. He was able to leverage his brand to sell other products and other revenue streams. He has restaurants. He has resorts. He has all sorts of things. He's become a businessman. But it took him years, years. There's no reason why you can't do that now as an independent. There is no reason. The power is in your hands. Like I said at the end of every Film Entrepreneur podcast, the power is in your hands. You need to be that Film Entrepreneur. You need to figure out how to generate revenue with your art. It is possible. It is doable. It is repeatable. And you can build a business around your art. So I hope this episode really opens your eyes to what the value of your movie is in the current marketplace. The more niche of a product you have, the more opportunity you have to make money with it. And that even includes in the traditional models. If you have a baseball movie, it's easier to sell. If you have a skateboard movie, if you've got a surfer movie, if you've got a vegan documentary or narrative film, it's easier to sell, even with traditional distributors. They're like, oh, well, there's an audience there. We can market to that audience. It makes their life easier too if you want to partner with a traditional distributor. 
I have multiple episodes about that, so I'm not going to get into that here. Now, I, I really do hope this opens your mind and the way you look at making movies. I want you to create the art you want to create. I want you to create the films that are pa- you're passionate about. But you just have to be smart about it. And I'm not saying that art house films or personal films can't get made in this model. Of course it can. I made a personal film called On the Corner of Ego and Desire. Comes out the 21st of January, 2020. And you know what? It's a personal film, but I made it for $3,000. I didn't make it for $30,000. I didn't make it for $300,000. I didn't make it for $3 million. I made it for three grand. I was able to do it at that price point. I could be experimental. And even then, I didn't even have to make it about a niche. I could have made that into whatever I wanted to. But I made it for my niche, my audience, which is you guys, filmmakers and screenwriters. And because of that, I'm able to generate revenue and do it again and make another experimental film. This is Meg. My first film was an experimental film as well. And I was able to make money because I targeted it towards my audience, my niche. So I hope this helps you guys. I really, really do. I want to thank you for listening so much. And of course, if you do want to pre-order The Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. It's available for pre-order in the ebook right now on Amazon, but the audiobook and the paperback will be available December 2nd. So please check it out. If not, just sign up for the list and I'll email you and let you know when everything is available. And it has already hit number one a couple times. It's still living now in the top 20 to 30 in our category in, in the movie in making area of Amazon books. And it's remarkable. People really, really want this. And I can't wait to get this book out to you guys. If you want to get links to anything I talked about in this episode, including that coupon code for Indie Film Hustle TV for Black Friday, just head over to filmtrepreneur.com forward slash 023 for the show notes. And there's a great article about everything I talked about in this episode there as well. So thanks again for listening. Again, happy Thanksgiving, guys. Happy Thanksgiving. Have a great Thanksgiving with yourself and your families. And uh, oh, and by the way, this is something I'm going to be doing after the new year. I'm going to go down to one episode a week for Indie Film Hustle. Instead of two a week, I'm going to do one a week. I'm still going to be doing one Film Entrepreneur episode, and I'm going to be doing one every other week on Bulletproof Screenwriting. So you're still going to get an obscene amount of content, but I'm just going to pull back one episode because there's projects that I want to focus my energy on and things I want to create for you guys. And you'll still get an obscene amount of content from me as you usually do, but just one less podcast a week. And I'm going to start that January 1st. So after January 1st, I'm going to do one a week. There might be the occasional two because I'm crazy. You know how I am. But as a general statement, it's going to be one film entrepreneur a week, one indie film hustle a week, and one bulletproof screenwriting every other week. So thank you guys for listening. I really do hope this was a value to you. Have a great holiday, great Thanksgiving. Oh, and I got a couple of Christmas surprises coming up for you as well. So keep an eye out for that. Thank you guys for listening. And as always, the power is in your hands. Be a film entrepreneur. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Film Entrepreneur Podcast at filmtrepreneur.com. 